<laughs> like nearly 30 years later. Hey, you uh you're like a legend. When you have like the entertainment world, and I mean they had reached that level, football players, actors. I saw I saw Iron Man. Yeah, Robert Downey Jr. wears my glasses. It's yeah, cool. Robert Downey Jr. wearing I'm like, yeah, I gotta get those. I gotta get those. <laughs> Um, it's nice. It's nice because because the celebrity following that we have is all about them wanting to wear our glasses. So we never, you know, we never go on the cynical kind of let's pay somebody to wear our glasses. And right, right. We, we don't go down that route. Um, we it's very much people come to us. So you talk about athletes. Jason Bell, the American footballer, um, is wearing our glasses as well. He loves them. He's got loads. Uh, uh, Nicholas Pinnock, uh, great British actor who is um, is doing really really well in the US at the moment. Mm. Um, he's wearing our glasses, but it, it's all people that have come to us, and it's it's lovely. It's a great, very gratifying feeling. You know, that's because you believe in what you do. You and Karen, you saw a vision, and when you believe in what you do, people feel that energy. They feel your energy. If they if he believe in, it, she believe in it, and it's an optical retailers and they believe in it the word of mouth is going to get out it's going to get out man and yeah i hope so i mean yeah we 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 we're not thinking um about what's the best what's the best way to describe this we're listening and we're thinking about what the consumer wants yes and we're trying to approach it as an industry like my grandfather did we're trying to think about this as a whole industry of independent optical people so when you start when you start with okay so so we're the center of our world is is the design that we do and the communication that we have with our clients but you have independent opticians you have trade shows you have lens people you have contact lens people you have people who make cloths and everybody every section of our industry every section of every industry right now but particularly in the small independent sector is challenged we're really really challenged but the thing that always strikes me when I look at look at our forums and I look at the communication when when we all get together, the independent sector of optics has an incredibly talented group of people, entrepreneurs that have so much energy and drive and ability, and yet we're so fragmented. You know, even now at this point when when everything is so difficult, we're in the middle of COVID and things are difficult. We should be working much, much closer together as a team, trying to protect our industry and trying to develop our industry. And I still see people challenging within our industry. And that should not be happening. We should be getting together and communicating the values that we share right across the different strands of our industry. And that is the only way that we're going to succeed, we're going to survive, and we're going to thrive. I truly agree. You know, because one thing as an optician, um, one thing that I know, even through the, the pandemic, people still love glasses. Yeah. They still need to see. And one of the things I learned growing up, I'm 53 years old, and I, and I, can, I can show the world who I am through my glasses, and I can see at the same time. It's like a win-win. And so people will always need glasses. They will always need frames. They always need lenses. And we have to, like you said, we have to come together as the opticians, private opticians, optical manufacturers, people like you and like me, share our passion, dig in each other's brains, right? And continue. Because it can't stop. The pandemic can't stop us. It will not stop us. And, and, and I love what you're saying. And I think also there's, there's something else here. If we can substitute that word need for desire, for want, let's change that because... You know, for me as a consumer, let's just forget the fact that I'm in optics, right? As a consumer, right, right. I'm looking around and I'm seeing that there is, like, I live in Brighton on the south coast of England, right? We haven't got too bad a pandemic situation here, but it's bad enough, you know? Right. It's bad enough, so we have to protect ourselves and we have to protect each other. And I've got vulnerable members of my family. So I don't really want to leave the house, okay? I've got to go to work. I can work from home sometimes, but I don't want to go shopping. I don't want to go wandering around the stores, seeing what's going on. I'm not likely to go shopping at an optician's, you know? So the thing is that that, that limits, if you're in that situation, that limits the optical retailer's audience to people who have a need or people who have a problem, right? And that will work to a certain extent. That's fine. That's part of your audience. But actually, 
for me, the real challenge right now is how do we make people want to get off their sofa and come into the optician and buy something because they want to spend some money because they love glasses so much and glasses make them feel amazing. Yes. The product, the environment, the communication, the people, all of those things have to be right. And it's not enough simply to say to people, well, you know, like our store is clean, it's hygienic. That's not going to get me off my sofa. What's going to get me off my sofa is a beautiful, beautiful pair of glasses, the like of which I haven't seen anywhere else. And I have to come into your store to try it on and buy it. That's what's going to make things work. And and once they put those frames on and look into the mirror, they see, you know, because one thing, you can turn a, a regular person into a superstar with glasses. Yeah. Yeah. You can turn a person who's who they call nerdy. People who don't even wear glasses want to wear glasses. They don't even yeah. need prescription. They want to change their look up. They want to be in vogue. Yeah. And so we, we had 12 questions for you, and I'm going to read one. And <laughs> how is the optical market performing these days? And you pretty much, I mean, where I work at, it seemed like people want to get out. They want to get, they want that human interaction. And so our business haven't really slowed down as much. People want to get out. They, they need it and they want to spend money for glasses. So uh, I haven't really seen a change. But um, in your part of the world, how is it going? Well, I think it's quite interesting for us because um, normally this is the first year that I haven't been on a plane for 30 years. So it's really interesting. I usually spend my time out with opticians all over the world. And it's great because I get a really wide perspective of what's happening. But I, I'm also fortunate that I have a, a team of great colleagues who are out doing that as much as they can. Right. And it depends, as you know, it depends where you are. I mean, even just in the US, just in the US, it's a huge geographical landmass. Um, there are areas where people are going out and they're shopping and they're interacting with each other and places where people are staying at home Mm -hmm. and, and not going out at all. Right. Where we are in the UK, uh, I think people are anxious, but there's the same kind of split. You know, that there are some people that are completely anti-mask and completely anti-vaccine and all this kind of stuff. And then you've got other people who are like, look, let's just stay at home, have a lockdown, try and get it done. So, but I think the trend that I'm seeing at the moment is that opticians are holding up quite well. They've changed their way of dealing with people and that was probably long overdue anyway. And I think that independent opticians are spending more time with each individual client by necessity. Um, there's got to be more time. There's got to be more listening and more understanding and giving people more attention. And I think that's resulting in better results. But should, I, I that, shouldn't it, it should always been that way? It should always listen it should, it should always be that way. And when I say better results as well, I mean, that doesn't just mean the money. Right. The better, the better result is when the, I'm going to say consumer, I don't know, some people say patient, some people say client, but I'm going to say when the consumer leaves your store, because it is a store, when the consumer right. leaves your store and has had an amazing experience, they've enjoyed spending time with you, they've enjoyed spending money with you, and they're going to go off and tell everybody else that they need to come to your store. And that is the result that we all need. And, you know, if... If before, if now, we haven't got enough time to spend with all of the people that want to spend time with us, then we can make more hours. We can change that. But it's a great problem to have. <laughs> it's like that is the only problem you want. It is a great problem to have. I noticed like in the United States, we have in every state, you don't have to be a licensed optician. Uh, I'm, I'm licensed and ABOC certified. I have a master's degree as well. I just graduated a few months ago. Congratulations. Thank you. But this field, as an optician, a lot of opticians don't look at it as a profession. It's a professional field. I'm a profession. I create happiness, optical happiness. I change lives. And when we find people, when we find opticians that think like we think, man, the optical world would be a much greater place. I promise it will. I think, yeah. I I think that um, certainly in the UK and largely in Europe, when you're trained as an optician, you're trained very scientifically. You know, you, you, you're trained about uh, uh, refraction and, all, you know, all the things that, that are um, 
and it'll say egocentric. It's all about it's all about you and how you do your job. And I think we need to turn that around and think about how the people who are our customers and our patients and the people who are not our patients, more importantly, mm-hmm. how they think about us and how they think about our profession, how they interact with us. You know, it's all very well drawing conclusions from the people that come in and that speak to us and that we listen to them or they write to us and we have some interaction with them. But the ones that we're not seeing are the ones we should be listening to. The ones who look at our social media and go, oh, yeah, I don't really fancy going there. Or they look at they look at the brands that we have on our website and they go, yeah, there's nothing really that, that grabs me. And it's those people we have to understand. And what is it that will excite them? What, what is it that will make them want to spend time with us? And I don't think as a profession, we're very well trained in that area. And I, that would benefit us so much to do that. Mm, mm, I love it. I love it. So um, my third question is, I was, how are sales trending for the independent frame brands? So. Well, I think independent frame brands are, it's hard for me to talk, to talk for other people. You know, normally speaking, we would have trade shows and we'd have a chance to get together. And we're all competitors, but we're all great friends. Most of us are great friends. Uh, so we share, you know, we share a lot. We share a lot of challenges. And I certainly try to listen to my um, colleagues uh, and see what they're doing. Some people are facing real problems just getting hold of stock. Mm-hmm. You know, let's, wherever you produce, uh, we produce in France. Everything we make is, is made in one factory in France from start to finish. So we know where it's going to be. We can trace it all the time. If you're making somewhere else that's more challenged by the pandemic, um, you can't necessarily get hold of your stock, or you may have had a lull in your stock, which is a problem. Um, I think that that one of the most important things for opticians, which relates to independent frame brands, is that right now you need to have every every inch of your retail space needs to work so much harder than it ever has. You know, it needs to appeal to your customer. And I think that independent brands offer that language that the consumer understands. You know, if we uh, have to be careful not to talk about other brands, uh, <laughs> having this conversation. But if we, you know, if we talk about if we talk about name brands, high street brands, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and they have their place, and there are, there are people that want those brands, and I completely respect that. But the thing is that if you're a consumer, you can buy those brands anywhere. And you can buy them online and I can guarantee that I can walk into your store and if you've got one of those brands, I can pick up my phone like most people do. Right. Even probably in front of you and go, hey, you know what? I can find this for $20 less. Yes. And when when that happens, it's like we can't. We can't compete. And worse than not competing, worse than losing that sale, we lose the confidence of the consumer. And that confidence is everything. We need to to make – consumers understand that we're offering something very very special with integrity with authenticity and something that'll make them feel amazing but it's genuine you know people this this costs a lot of money it's probably worth a great deal more than it costs but we have to communicate that value clearly to the consumer and if we don't do that then the consumer will lose confidence in us that's a that's a really big challenge for our industry and always has been and especially like what you just said to add upon that to to know the the history, his story, his story behind the brand. When the, when the optician or optical uh, office or store has those brands in their office to know the backstory. Yeah. The brand. Oh my God, the backstory of that brand. It's so it's so important and the best stores the most successful stores are the ones that communicate the stories of each brand that they carry and i you know i'm not recommending i'm not telling anybody how to run their business but some of the, the stores that do best with us only carry a very limited number of brands but they go into them very very well everybody who works in their store knows the brand inside out knows exactly the way around it there's no hesitation and it's that confidence the way that they present it the way that they talk about it the way it's merchandised on the shelves that comes across to the customer. I've got a really a, an interesting story. It's a, it's a pandemic story. Okay. So I, um, we had a, a UK optician that I went to visit at the beginning of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And they were just about to lock down. And they said, right, you know, we, the advice from, we have the General Optical Council, the advice from the GOC 
is that we have to clean everything down, take everything off the shelves, not let people try it on. Panic mode. <laughs> Panic mode. Ah! And the whole, the whole kind of direction of, of, of travel for the optician was about cleanliness and hygiene. And I understand that and respect that completely. That's thinking about the optician and not really thinking about the consumer. Because if your store isn't hygienic anyway, if it wasn't hygienic a year ago, it's like right. you know, the customer expects yeah, All of a sudden, right? But the, the, really, the thing that really struck me was about presentation. And mm-hmm. so they've taken all the frames off the shelves. And what they decided to do was to have like 10 frames up and visible, which were representative of, in this case, it was representative of the different brands that they had. And they were concerned about that. And I actually thought, I actually saw it as a strength. I saw it as a real strength because the reality of what they'd taken down off the shelves was 150 tortoiseshell frames. Mm. They're all looking alike. <laughs> they all look alike. So when we're talking about, when we're talking about how hard your retail space needs to work, right. you don't need 50 tortoiseshell frames. You don't need 50 black frames, 50 crystal frames. You need a few that represent the shapes that are going to work for your varied customers, but then you need collections and frames and colors and shapes which are going to do something different. Every frame has to work, and then you need to communicate on all that because, you know, like I said before, I'm not going to get off my sofa to come into your store to buy a toilet shell frame. Why would I do that? You know, I can buy it, I can find something. If it's not the same, I can find something almost the same online or in some cheap multiple store and right now i'm going to make my life as easy as like easy as i can as a consumer that's right because what i understand what makes you stand out when you're the same you're the same purple cow that like all the other purple cows or all the other yellow cows green cows what makes you exclusive what makes you different what is your why and are you giving my? Are you giving me the consumer my why? I should shop and do business with you. Yeah, man. Exactly. Oh my God. Yes, yeah. So my next question is: that life is tricky these days. Where should opticians be focused on? Focus their energy on throughout the day. It's a tough question. Because life is tricky, and it's different for different people in different places with different stores. There's no single answer. There's no one size fits right. all. But in my opinion, as a, as a retailer with rent to pay and salaries to pay, you can't cut any corners. There's no, it's like, if I say to you, okay, you've got to focus on your communication, your social media, your window in the literal and figurative sense of the word. Yes, of course you have, right? Right. But that's not all. That's not all you can be all. Right, right. You know, focus on, on hygiene and cleanliness and communicating your hygienic aspect of your, yeah, of course, of course, but that's not enough. Focus on product, absolutely, because that's the thing, you know, I, I don't know many consumers, I'm not going to say not any, but I don't know many consumers that get excited about contact lens solutions, you know, but they're going to get excited about, about a, you know, an, an orange frame or they're going to get excited about something that's different that they've never seen before. Or even as you alluded to before, like, like a story about a frame or a story about a brand. I want to find out more about that. So I think, I think focusing on particular simple answer, focusing on what makes you unique as a store. I think that's really, really important. And, and, you know, and also, sorry, I know I'm babbling, but um, I saw an interview today on LinkedIn and, and somebody was talking about what makes them, unique as a store and their unique right. proposition and they reeled off a list of things which were not unique you know let's let's think about the words that have lost their value like we talk about luxury we talk about unique we talk about independent we talk about custom made these words have real meaning real value yes and if we if we bandy them around if we bandy around the word luxury just to mean something that costs more than a certain price. That's not luxury. And once again, we will lose the confidence of our clients. And we've got to respect everything, every aspect of our business. And so what luxury is to me may not be luxury to the next person. I have, 
I'm babbling as well. I had a, I had a client yesterday, and that was uh, one of my opticians was selling glasses. And so the guy, he was telling about anti-reflective coating, a little bit of the importance of it and why, she, why he should have the blue filter, right? The guy at the client, right? So the guy was with his son. His son was buying glasses as well. His son, 22 years old, by the girl who graduated college. That's his chemist. And that, we start talking. I, I like the vibe. I try to, I live, I, I, I feed off other people's energies, right? So the guy was sitting in front of him. His name is Caffey. I said, Caffey? I said, that's a beautiful name. I said, that's the name of a tiger? He said, yeah, yeah. I said, dad, I'm like, yeah, yeah. So we was talking, we was talking about his, I got into his optical world. I said, so you you have a prescription. I'm looking at it, but I don't see glasses. Well, how do you see your glasses? My dog ate him up. I was like, oh my God. I said, do you not care about your eyes? Do you not care about your glasses? Do you need these things? You need them to see. He said, yes, I know, I know, Mr. Butler, I know. So we started talking and we picked out some nice frames. And so I was telling him about, so his dad, he's, he's listening, he's earshot, he's listening. I said, hey, I said, um, the doctor, he did prescribe. I didn't say recommend, because you can recommend a meal. The doctor did prescribe anti reflective code. He advised that you get the anti reflective code with the blue filter. He said, tell me about that. I said, well, I said, you know, when the sky is blue, when it's sunny, you look up in the sky and it's blue. He said, yes. I said, that's an illusion. That's the blue spectrum of the, of the light spectrum. I said, it keeps us awake, it helps us stay alert, helps with our moods and our memory. I said, but over exposure of, you know, uh, smart tablets, smartphones, computer screens, smart TV. I said, we have an over exposure of artificial blue light. So I'm breaking it to my dad listening, right? He listening, right? Listen. I said, uh, I said, it, it starts to interfere with your 24 hour circadian biological clock rhythm. It slows down the production of melatonin. I said, why you can't sleep at night? I said, what time do you, I said, what's your, what's your daily, what, what, when do you go to sleep at nighttime? He said, I usually go between one and two. I said, yeah, I know. I know. I said, did your glasses have anti-glare? No. I said, I know. Says so David, listen. He said, I want that. I want that. And they dad like, wait, wait a minute. The other guy, he didn't explain it to me like that. He said, he didn't tell me that way. He said, I want that. He's worth that. I want that. So it's the way how you, your energy, your passion, your belief in the product, because we're an energy, right? Absolutely. We're an energy. We're spiritual beings having a human experience. And we can, you have to walk in a room and you say, hey, man, it's so, I can feel the tension. It's so thick in here with tension <laughs> because you feel their energy. Yeah. So I think that opticians should come with the right energy. You have to know as well. You have to be the know it all optically. You yeah, have, of course. You got to have the right energy. I remember when I was uh, hiring people, I never hired people who was ABOC certified because they try to act like they just know a little bit too much. I hired people who love people because we are, we are in the, we, we're dealing with people. We're in a relationship yeah. business with people. Absolutely. <laughs> so my next question, <laughs> man, my next question, what types of opticals uh, what types of opticals are doing doing it right? And what best practice may op opticals want to consider implementing during this time? Um, interesting. I, I think that a lot of the independents are doing it right. The feedback that I get right now is that independents are doing well and that they are being forced to rethink their business. And that is working. The things that we've already touched on, I, and so I don't want to repeat myself, right. but um, you know, it's, it's the amount of time and attention that you give somebody um, and the products that you offer them and the way that you communicate. You know, like we've, we've had time, people have had to just completely rethink their businesses. I look at yes. some of the big chains and I wonder, mm. I wonder. You know, I don't think, doesn't feel to me like people just want to go out and treat themselves to a new pair of glasses. I've got, I'll buy something cheap because I just want a new pair of glasses. I think right now that people are saving their money to buy good things, well-made things, things that they care about and can keep. And, and, and I think that is why independent opticians with great product are doing well at the moment. Mm, nice, nice. Um, what might 
private optical successfully complete with online retailers, optical chains, and insurance plans dictating front frame buying behaviors. Insurance. Wow. I don't even call it insurance. When, when a patient or a client's in front of me, I don't, oh, my insurance say that I have $130 uh, to, I said, no, no, no. I said, your vision care benefits contributes yeah. $130 to any frame in my optical. Yeah, it, you know, it's 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 the same problem. It's the same thing that we've been talking about. It's a, it's about communicating and creating a desire. You know, and if and even if they still think, well, I've only got one hundred and thirty dollars available to me, and you explain why something that's one hundred and fifty dollars is going to give them so much more pleasure and benefit, whatever that benefit may be, it may be um, vision or comfort, whatever that is then it becomes price positive and they want to spend more. And I think that we have to learn as a profession to communicate those values and the value of what somebody spends so much more. I mean, it's hard, isn't it? You, you know, people, even my, a lot of my friends who, who wear our glasses and spend a lot of money on, on a Kirk & Kirk product, they're like, yeah, I want to get new glasses, but I'm going to have to spend like $500 on lenses or or sometimes a lot more than that. And what they perceive that they're buying is two pieces of plastic. Some of them don't even realize it's plastic. Uh, two pieces of glass uh, that, that they can see through. And it's like, why is, that, why is that $500? They don't understand. And so as a profession, we haven't mastered how to communicate those values. You know, the difference between one verifocal and another verifocal, it's... Mm -hmm. It's a real subtlety and it's a real art to be able to communicate that and the best opticians know how to do that. But it's not just about that final moment when you're getting someone to spend money on something. It's about that first moment before you're face-to-face -face with the client. And it's actually making them think, well, I want to go into that store. Mm -hmm. I actually want to get off my sofa. I actually want to go to that independent instead of going to Specsavers, you know, we have to communicate that better. And to and when I come in your business, you make me feel like a person, not a number. Yeah. You know, it's, it's amazing. Just like you said, they think of it because they don't know the science behind, uh, you know, how frames are made, how the science behind the different uh, uh, lens materials and the science behind different progressive, different progressive shapes and sizes and designs but you look at them and i asked this question to this one lady a few a few months ago i said wow i said you have a you have an iphone you have an iphone 11 would you not want that same technology on your lenses i mean the iphone 11 has it 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 it, it, it clears out it dims out at nighttime to protect your eyes against harmful blue light it has anti Anti-reflective coating on it. Wouldn't you not want that on your eyes? Yeah. I mean, and then she just sat back and she just like, hey, well, you know what? You got a point there. Yeah, it's absolutely right. And, and I think in the same way, each consumer, when you were saying before, luxury means different things to different people. Each consumer, each individual wants something different from yeah. their glasses. And they might have multi, might have one pair of glasses and um, it's a financial stretch for them and we have to respect that. Or in the same way, I've got clients who've got individual clients that have got like 20 pairs of glasses. Yes. And, but they have, you know, it's not because they've got money that it's like, oh, I'll just buy another pair. They want something special from everything that they buy and yes. everything they're looking for. And, and it's about listening in the same way that when I go to an optician, I have to listen to what they need for their store and understand what they need. It's the same whether it's a customer, um, an optical customer or a consumer. It doesn't make any difference. It's all about listening and understanding what, what it is that they need. Awesome. I tell people, I tell clients all the time, I say, hey, listen, I say, um, I know it's, picking up frames can be daunting. You have these choices. I said, but listen, listen, they listen. I said, hey, when you walk in a room, I said, what do people do? Well, they... They look you all up in your face. <laughs> they zone in on your face. 
I said, then they're going to zone in on your eyes. So frames, glasses. I said, they're very intimate. They're personal. I need you to love them. Love them. They become a part of you. They tell the world who you are. You're introducing yourself to the world. I need Absolutely. you to love them. They're very intimate. Very intimate. And I learned that. I learned that probably within the last five years, how intimate frames, how they change lives. Yeah. yeah. Very intimate. Very intimate. So my my question has social distancing impacted relationships with frame reps? Yeah, I mean, again, it depends on geographically where those reps are. So I've got I've got some reps that are being welcomed into stores and never really had very much time when they weren't welcomed into stores. Um, and I've got some reps who just can't actually get face to face with the client because partly the clients don't want to and partly the reps are nervous too about protecting themselves and protecting their loved ones. Um, we have found a great resource in Zoom, of course, uh, and, and we, get to do, we get to do a lot of Zoom presentations, a lot of communication by Zoom. Um, you know, we're not traveling, we're not doing trade shows, but I think that if you, if you already know a collection, mm-hmm. Then you can, you know, you can you can look at this frame. If you've got Kirk and Kirk in your store, you know the quality of the frame. You know what it weighs. You know what it feels like. So this is another variation of something that you're comfortable with. So that's allowed us to do that. That's been that's been great. One thing one thing I know is um, your frames. Uh, I love the colors, the bright. The, it's like it zooms confidence and energy. And then to illuminate the transparent colors, the acetate. It's not it's not even acetate. You use acrylic, right? Yes, that's right. It, it seems like what the colors, you can put it, it like when you walk in a room in a dim lit room, you still see the colors. It, it's really <laughs> interesting. I mean, we, so this is so, and this is a great example of one of our really right. strong toys. So we call this tiger. Uh, and the material is, is 10 millimeters thick. Right, I see. So there are, there are two, well, there are lots of great qualities for acrylic, but there are two main qualities. The first is that it weighs absolutely nothing. So you can have a great big chunky frame like this, but it's so light, it's yeah. so comfortable to wear. So that's really beautiful. And also, because we create our own materials, we can create our own colors right down to the Pantone. So you've got something like this, and then you've got something like, I'm gonna take these, I'm gonna put a different frame on so that I can take these right. off, because I right. can't. Okay. I'm reaching the age. Let's go. Without my glasses. <laughs> so you can see on this, there are two colors there. This is the yes, yes. collection nice. and it's millimeters. But we can control absolutely down to the Pantone what colors we have, what thicknesses we have, et cetera. So, so the marriage of those colors means that, you know, for an optician, which is the most important thing for our clients, they can have a collection that really stands out that nobody else has got. And that helps differentiate their store so when you're looking for something to drive people off the sofa, that's what does it. Yes, it. Yes, it. May I totally concur. Yes, it. Beautiful frames. Beautiful. Thank you. beautiful. Just light up the room. You know I'm a rock up here. Or two. Great. I Fantastic. Promise, I promise I am. I'm the fly optician. I have to. <laughs> you have to. <laughs> so what problems are optical owners and managers trying to solve right now? I think we talked about that. I mean, even before I even asked this question, we have already uh, expound. You have already expound upon it. I think we have, you know. It's like you've got fewer people coming into your store. How do you get them to enjoy spending money and then to go off and tell their friends to come in and spend money too? How do you satisfy your audience? That's that's the big challenge. Uh, And I think people are generally doing a really great job right now. So how do we deal with the uncertainty, the uncertainty in the independent optical industry? Ah, and, that, and that's, that's the same for everybody. I mean, it's not, sadly, it's not unique to our business. Um, you know, for us at the moment, we're, we're doing really well. And, and then we're painfully aware that tomorrow could be horrible. You know, it's, mm-hmm. It, mm-hmm. it's what do you do? I th- when, on a more general business level, rather than just on an optical level, when the pandemic hit and we had a lockdown, which started in March, we started having regular cash flow meetings, right? Right. Super business orientated, not enjoyable at all. But 
having that information at your fingertips and having as certain knowledge as you can, because nothing's certain at the moment, but having as many certainties as you can helps you have a foundation to take your business forward, helps you make decisions, helps you understand what the risks are with each decision that you're making. And that's very, very important. We've, um, we've got a, a great team around us, not just in, in the optical side and the design side, but also in the finance side as well. And that's helped us steady the ship. So dealing with uncertainty is just about minimizing your risk. And then the next stage that seems to happen in, in the evolution of a business through this pandemic is that you go through the cash flow thing. And once you decided after a period of probably months for most people, certainly for us it's months, that you've got that cash flow mastered and like the, the meetings that you're having every week or whatever it is are actually showing accurate figures and your predictions were right. Once you've got to that point, you're post cash flow and you can start to make decisions based on the knowledge that you will have a certain amount of money to do promotion this month or whatever it is. So slowly, slowly um, building, eliminating as much uncertainty as you can and then making priority decisions. You know, it's like we don't, we don't have unlimited funds, so we have to decide whether we're going to do design and build and invest in another collection or do we spend that money on communicating better the collections that we have now? All those kind of decisions, you know, and, and it's, yeah, it's a tough one. It's almost like, you know, because, uh, you know, 2020, I'll, just throw the whole year away. <laughs> throw the whole dang year away. It's been that type of year. But you have to look at the positive sides as well. Yeah. I mean, you know, we never, you have to have a mindset like we never lose. We either win or we learn. What have you learned? You know, what have you learned from this? Um, I've learned that nothing is certain. I've learned to value my friendships. You know, like the, like my friends that I've got people that live like two doors down from me, great friends. And I've got people that live on the opposite side of the world. And I see them at four or five trade shows every year, at least. And they're great friends. And I spend as much time with both of those groups. Um, so I miss my optical friends a lot. And I value their friendships. Um, some of those people I've known for like, 30 years you know it's uh yeah it's important it's in, it's in the yeah. human side the human side of what we do is so important so so important man it's so important and to have you know I, I mean yes you can you can have um online industries and online business but you can never ever ever to me compete with the human side of things that's why, well. that's why word of mouth, even though we have computers, we have the internet, we have Wi-Fi, the cloud, word of mouth is still the best advertising. Absolutely, it is. But, you know, it's very interesting as well because that whole um, internet online world has collided and exploded with our world. And uh, most of the opticians that I know for up until a year ago were vehemently anti-internet anti-internet sales, anti-internet communication, just like, you know, this is a human business, this is face-to-face. -face. The reality of our world, and this is a big challenge for all of us, the reality of our world now is that decisions are made on the internet. Decisions yes. are made before you and I are in front of our clients. Yes. And people are sitting at home deciding, deciding whether they want glasses, let alone where they want their glasses or... You know, and making making ill informed judgments because we haven't communicated well enough. Hmm. You know, if something's if something's wrong, if anything's wrong, it's my fault. I'm going to ask myself what I could have done better to get that across. Right. You know, and it, and it, even when even when um, a consumer is put off buying uh, a whole new set of frames and lenses because the lenses are too expensive. I need to explain to him, if nobody else has done it, that's my responsibility. And this is where we all need to be working as a unit, as a, as a galvanized, independent industry. Lots of different strands to what we do, but let's all get together. The internet is part of what we do. We should be sharing and caring, not like arguing with each other and, and, right. and competing with each other. Exactly, you have to evolve. Yeah. 
If you're not evolving, you're dying. Yeah, absolutely. You have to, it's a continuous process every day to evolve, to evolve. And it's, and it's acting respectfully as well. You know, the, the, internet, the internet is a, is a shop window, just the same, just the same as any retail store. Yes. And you have to behave respectfully. You know, if you don't behave respectfully in your store, in your physical store, um, people don't want to come and see you. People don't want to interact with you. Your colleagues and competitors in the industry don't like you and they'll talk about you behind your back and all that kind of stuff. And you have to have exactly that same level of respect when you're online. That's true. That's true. And I hate people to talk behind your back. I said, well, did I hurt? Did I hurt? Did, did my back hurt your knife? <laughs> <laughs> did I dam- did my back damage your knife? <laughs> hey, so, uh, Jason, uh, what is the one question I should be asking you that I haven't asked you yet? Wow. Um, Look, I'm putting my hands up. <laughs> yeah, I know you're making it even tougher now. <laughs> Well, well, you also, I, I you guess. Awesome. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I guess what is what is the future for us? That's a question that I can't answer. <laughs> so ask me a question that I can't answer. Like, yeah, what is the future for independent optics? You know, things are, things are. That's what everybody wants to know. When is it going to get back to normal? And what will normal look like? Uh, normal normal is not going to look like it looked a year yes. ago. We will never. That normal will not be normal what yeah. we were normal let's Over let's talk end. about we have, know, to let's, own it. we have to own it how do you, you know how do you as a as an optician how does the consumer find amazing eyewear how's that going to happen because you would have answered me a year ago well i'm going to go to silmo i'm going to go to Mido, i'm going to go to vision expo or the loft in new york and i'm going to go and look at the brands meet the people and find out what's going on you don't have that option now you're probably not going to have that option for at least a year. It may never happen again. Sure. You know, I am, along with my team, like we're looking at what trade shows we would consider in the future. We're not considering, and from a timing perspective, there's no way that we consider anything in the spring. Mm. You've got trade shows coming up. Been, they've been moved, uh, moved to times that don't necessarily suit the buyer. You know, so... so what are we doing? Are we organizing trade shows that suit trade shows? No. <laughs> We've got to organize trade shows that suit right, right. And then when you have those trade shows and people have got used to, and I find myself doing this all the time, you get used to this idea of not getting close to people. You know, I'm a real touchy-feely, shaky hands and mm-hmm. have a little, you know, here's a hug and nice to see you. That's the way I, I operate with people. And yet I've noticed that in the last couple of months, I'm pulling back from people and avoiding people. And you get used to that. Mm-hmm. So when we do finally get the opportunity to all get together again, and it feels like a safe environment, are people going to want to do that? Is that going to be the way that we move forward? Or will it take such a long period of time that we don't have the luxury of time to, um, to just sit and wait for that to happen? As business people, we have rent to pay, we have mouths to feed. Right. So now we have to find new solutions to how we find things to take our business forward. We cannot, you cannot by definition sit still and wait for this to pass. You have to move forward. You know, I have a, a old saying about waiting. Wait broke the wagon. <laughs> right? Right. If the wagon is broke, we're not going anywhere. So yeah. you cannot wait on it to happen. It's not going to yeah. just happen because you're waiting on it. You have to make it happen. Absolutely. You That's have to great. evolve. You have to think new ways. You have to make it happen. It's all on you. So Can I borrow that one? Hmm? Can I borrow that one? It's yours. I give that to you for free. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> hey, man. Thank you for your time. Thank you. It's been, it's been absolutely amazing. Pleasure. It's been, I love your energy. Your energy match your eyewear. Thank you very much. Me too. It's been an absolute pleasure meeting you. I love what Daily Optician are doing. I think it's really shaking up the optical world. Um, and it's just what we need right now. We need a space where people can come and discover new and exciting things, discover new and exciting people in our industry. That's what we need to do. We need, we need places where new and exciting people can talk to each other, share ideas generously, and help our industry move forward. Man, in a nutshell, in a nutshell, 
that is correct. That is correct. As we say in, in my part of the world, that what that is. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you. It was an honor to talk to you and, and meet you. I heard so Peter told me so much about you. He saw you nervous. I said, nervous. I said, I'm excited. I can't wait. Oh, Let's that's very that's very sweet of both of you. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been really lovely to meet you. I've been looking forward to it. Man, hey, keep rising, stay prosperous, keep evolving. Thank you. You too. We'll speak soon. Yes, sir. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.